be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is necessary from time to time to reflect on how to make a good confession. For all of us, that applies. And so what I'm about to say, which deals with how to make a good confession, is not taken from anything I've heard here. People very often are concerned that maybe he's talking about me, but that's not the case. These are general problems which you see everywhere you go. It's general problems which the church herself has addressed in documents, and it's general problems which saints and spiritual writers find uh, across the board. So if something applies to you, it doesn't mean it's not meant personally, it's just meant for you to know this so that you can make a good confession. In the Baltimore Catechism, we read that there are several things that go into making a good confession. And one of them is, of course, one of the first things that we have to make a good examination of conscience before we go to confession, not while you're there. Sometimes you'll find that a priest will actually have to sit while the person is examining their conscience while they're confessing. Now, it's one thing if you've done examination of conscience and you get a little bit nervous when you're there and you forget things, that's one thing. But if you're making the priest sit there for a long period of time because you're trying to think of the various sins that you've committed, it's, it's not appropriate. You should have done that beforehand. Also, you'll find that if, if people don't do a good examination beforehand, then as the priest is just about to give, um, give absolution, they'll blurt something out, like, oh, Father, I forgot something. Or they'll forget things, and then after confession, they'll remember things. So it's important that you make a good examination of conscience beforehand. Uh, also, it's important for us to have the chief qualities of a good confession, which are humility, sincerity, and entirety sometimes called integrity. Humility is encompassed when we recognize, we, we go to confession humbly, we recognize what we've committed and the evil that we've done, and so we do not judge ourselves greater than we are, but we try to live in accordance with the truth. Confession is the sacrament of humility, because we all have to go and humiliate ourselves, but this is a necessary thing for us to be, um, to be a reconciled with God if we've committed mortal sin, but also, and to come there into the state of grace, but also it's a necessary thing for us in order to advance in the spiritual life. We should accuse ourselves of our sins with a deep sense of shame and sorrow for having offended God. If you're truly humble, that's the way you'll see it. <coughs> Next, you have to have sincerity. And this encompasses the idea that our confessions should be honest and truthful, neither exaggerating nor excusing ourselves from sin. Once in a while you get people who exaggerate their sin to try and manifest how sorry they are. Sometimes you get people who will make con um, excuses for their sin, so they might confess something, and yet they'll go through a whole litany of excuses trying to make it not look as bad in the eyes of the priest. You have to remember that the priest is there to judge your sin as it is so that a proper penance, and a proportionate and a proper penance can be given. So don't make excuses for your sin. Now that's different from stating the circumstances, which we'll see a little bit later. But don't make excuses for your sin. Just state them plainly and clearly. Next, it should be integral. And by that we mean that there are three things that you have to state. By integral we mean that it's whole. You have, there's three things you have to state in order for the priest to be able to make a proper assessment of what you've done. And that is species, number, and circumstances. Species indicates the kind of sin that you've committed. So you have to state as clearly as you can the type of sin that you have committed. You have to be frank but not crude. And so sometimes, too, when people get a little worked up in the confessional, they'll actually, use, they'll actually profane or use vulgarity because they get all worked up. Uh, try and avoid that because then the priest is stuck telling you you just profaned our Lord's name. And then, of course, they feel bad. But the point is, is that try and be as clear and as, uh, and as frank as possible when it's necessary. Emotional states are not species. Now, emotional states only become sinful when they are evil and we give, that is, they incline us to something evil, but they're not sinful in themselves. They're only sinful once you will it, that is, once you entertain them or perpetuate them. So if you, if you have emotional states, you don't have to confess those unless you've given in to the inclination to which they are, um, which they're inclining you towards. Sometimes you'll hear people, they'll come in and they'll say things like, well, I feel terrible and awful all day long and I've been feeling depressed and my ankle hurts and this and that. And I'm like, where's the sin? 
So you have to be careful about that. Um, obviously, the priest is concerned that people are feeling well, but that's beside the point. This is a tribunal of justice, and that means that feelings aren't the real issue unless, again, they come into circumstances. But it really should be um, just tell me what you did. What did you do? Uh, sometimes people will come in and they'll have only one sin, but it takes them five minutes to tell you that they lied. I mean, all that is, you know, I lied three times. Instead, you get this five-minute discussion about, you know, everything that's going on in their life or whatever the case is, and they don't actually tell you that they lied or they tell you they lied, but you get that to the end. So try and be clear and brief. Brevity is a good thing to be keep in mind. Be brief to the degree that's necessary to explain what's happened. Sometimes you get people who just go on and on and on about the same sin or whatever the case may be, and uh, you don't want to have to tell them there's a vice called loquacity, that is, it's speaking too much. We get a certain pleasure from talking, and we have to moderate that, and sometimes people come into the confession. Again, if they're nervous, that's one thing, but um, because people can talk when they're nervous, talk a lot when they're nervous, but sometimes people just come in and they're just talk, 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 and you're, you're trying to sort, the priest spends an enormous amount of psychological energy sorting out exactly where the sin lies. So if you can just state it briefly, and what, they, what, what you actually did. The next is number, so species and number. Number is you need to tell the priest how often or how many times you did each of the sins. Because what happens is, is that if it's a mortal sin, the Council of Trent says that you have to give a number. Now, sometimes you can't know exactly what the number is, so you just have to estimate. You know, like, well, I think it was five times. or. If you're not even certain, even on that level, you can just say a number of times. Um, but you should try and be as accurate as possible, because the Council of Trent says that since you have to confess all mortal sins, if you just, you know, if you say, Father, I committed murder, well, how many times, you know? Is it once or 50? I mean, what are we talking about here? And so it's important for the priest to know exactly how many, because sometimes people can hide their sinfulness behind being vague on the number or that type of thing. You have to be as accurately as possible. Again, if you're not certain, that's one thing. But if you know, you have to state exactly how many. It's also necessary for the priest to know whether something's a real problem or not. I mean, if you come in and you say, well, I lied once, but um, then a priest recognizes, well, okay, it's not that big of a deal. I'm not going to worry. I mean, you might get, get, uh, get some counsel regarding it, but um, if you come in and you say, I lied 50 times, that's another matter. So the priest needs to know how often you've done it. So uh, species and number. The next is circumstances. Circumstances are all those things which stand around the action which add to or take away from the gravity of what you've done. So moralists very often give the example of if you kill somebody, that's the species, but there's different kinds of killing. For instance, you could shoot them in the head, which is one thing, or you could torture them to death by water torture. Well, that's much worse. So you have to actually mention the circumstances. Or another example is if you lied. Okay, you lied. Well, uh, it's, it's one thing to say you lied. It's another thing to say, well, I lied because somebody had a gun to my head. Okay, so that makes it a little, doesn't make it as, you know, lightens the, the, the gravity of the sin a bit. It's still sinful because you shouldn't lie, even in those circumstances, because you cannot commit a sin in order to save your life. But, nevertheless, it's important for the priest to know that to be able to, again, sign a proper penance and make a proper judgment about it. However, there's the opposite extreme. Sometimes people won't give you any circumstances, but then there's the opposite extreme where people circumstance the priest to death. And by that we mean that they'll, they'll come in and they state all these things that are circumstances that, are not, uh, that don't apply to the sin that they're talking about. For example, someone would come in and say, I baked a cake, and then my husband got mad because it wasn't the cake he wanted, and then he kicked and shot the dog, and so I gave him a cross word about the dog, and then my daughter got mad at my husband, and then she broke up with her boyfriend, and you're just like, okay, so what you're telling me is, is that you said a cross word to your husband. So the point is, is that you only should say those things which actually affect the gravity of what you've done. So those are the new things we read in the Baltimore Catechism. The next are observations which other spiritual writers tell us that we should keep in mind. The first is, is that the confessional is only the place for matters that require short amounts of time for advice unless you have something that is, uh, I mean, obviously if somebody comes in and it's been 30 years since they've been to confession, it's going to take a little while. But if you have a question, 
about something that you know is going to take 20 minutes just to explain the complexities of it, the confessional normally is not the place for it. You should try and make an appointment with the priest. And even if you, if you want to do it anonymously, just ask him if you can meet him at the church at such a time in the confessional, and then it can still be done anonymously. That shouldn't, however, keep you from asking questions. I mean, we want people to ask questions if it'll help to clear up things in their spiritual life, but uh, it shouldn't be a never-ending process, and it shouldn't take that too much time. Part of that is because you have to have courtesy for the other people, and it's a matter of charity, for waiting for people who are in line. Also, try to get to confession early enough to have your confession heard, like, for instance, if it's before Mass, because sometimes people will kind of dawdle a little bit when they should actually be, you know, getting their act together so they can get to confession, especially if it's a mortal, if, there's, if they're in the state of mortal sin. They should get to confession before they receive communion, because receiving communion in the state of mortal sin is a sacrilege, as St. Paul teaches, in which the Church has constantly and always taught, even to this day. So it's a mortal sin to receive communion in the state of mortal sin, so make sure you get to confession beforehand. Now, it's true that the Church teaches us that we can make a perfect act of contrition and then that will restore us to grace. But the problem is, is that perfect contrition doesn't grow on trees, even though people want to act like it does. It's very difficult. It requir requires specific graces because the person has to be sorry for the sin strictly because it has offended God. If it's mixed, that is, if they are sorry because they're afraid they're going to hell, that's not perfect contrition and it does not suffice. That's why it's best for people to get to, con uh, to uh, confession beforehand. Also, you should know how to go to confession properly. And by this we mean you should know the formula, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, my last confession was X, I'm a, I'm a man, um, I'm a married man, or something to that extent. In other words, you should know the formula, that is, how to go to confession. Now, if by chance you, it's been a long time since you've been to confession, or if you just haven't, you know, if, if it's one of those things where you're just really having a hard time learning it, you should still get to confession and then you can ask the priest to help you out. But you have to take reasonable means to know this, so make sure you learn how to go to confession. Also, you should know an act of contrition. Now, the traditional act of contrition is better because it expresses um, purpose of amendment and things like that, and, and it expresses contrition and attrition and things like that that are more um, apropos than some of the more modern versions that tend to kind of cut things out or make them more vague. It's better to be more concrete and clear. And this is particularly important for parents to teach their children because even though it's less of a problem among traditional groups, it is a big problem just generally where children will come in and they don't know the act of contrition or they don't know how to know how to go to confession, and it's because the parents haven't taken the time to teach the child. Again, if he's nervous or whatever the case is, that's one thing, but if he just simply doesn't know at all, that's another matter. It's a matter of neglect. Um, when a priest gives you advice about a particular sin, do not share your advice with other people. Now, there's several reasons for this. The first is because the circumstances, when the priest judges to give you a specific um, kind of advice, he has to judge the circumstances of your sin or the difficulty that you're going through. And those circumstances may not fit the circumstances that other people are in, and so the advice that you give them, even though you might have heard it from a priest, may not exactly fit. And sometimes this creates kind of a problem because if a priest gives a very technical answer to somebody and says do this or don't do that because of their circumstances and someone else comes along and says something similar and you say, oh, well, just do this. This is what Father told me to do. It may not apply to him and then you might be reculpable for the sin if, they're, if it's bad advice. So what you do is if you find that there's a piece of advice that a priest has given you that's quite good and someone else finds themselves in similar circumstances or it's a similar kind of a sin, tell them, you know, maybe you should go talk to Father so-and-so because he's much, he, he, he gave me good advice in that area, so go talk to him. Also, it can lead to scandal. If you're telling the advice that somebody gave you, it may reveal your sin. And you shouldn't reveal your sin unless it's absolutely necessary. There is also the seal of confession. Now, the seal of confession applies to the priest in the sense that if he, if he says anything volitionally um, about the sins of another person that he hears within the outside of the confessional, it's automatic excommunication. He's immediately kicked out of the church. But the seal of confession also applies to people that aren't the priests. Uh, we're not talking about the person who's confessing because he has a right to say things on his own provided prudence and these other circumstances which I mentioned before are observed, but he has a right to divulge what's in his inter own interior life. He has that right. However, 
if you happen to hear someone else's confession. Also, make sure you mention your state in life. That is, if you're a married man, a single man, or a single woman, or a married woman, if you're a priest or a religious, the priest needs to know these things. Why? Well, if you're religious and you're entertaining impure thoughts, it's in addition to a sin against the Sixth Commandment, it's a sin against the First Commandment called sacrilege, because you're under a vow. If you're a married man and you entertain impure thoughts about other women, it's adulterous in character, which makes it worse for them to entertain impure thoughts about other people than, the, uh, than someone who's not married. So the priest needs to know your state in life in order to assess precisely where the sin lies. You should also have the practice of saying, for these are the sins of my past life, and then mention, especially the sins against the virtue of X or the sins of X, because this does two things. One, it helps to assure that the priest has sufficient matter. Because if you remember, I was saying some people come in and they talk and they talk and they talk. Some people will confess everyone else's sins but their own. So you get to the end. I've actually had to do this before. You get to the end and you say, well, I don't have any matter. Could you <laughs> state one of your sins? Uh, but the point being is, is that it assures that the priest has sufficient matter for absolution, just in case. Because there are people who get to a certain stage in their spiritual life where they're really just grappling with imperfections more than they are sins. And you can't absolve imperfections. You can only absolve sins, even though the absolution does help with the imperfections. It is also... Um, necessary if you're trying to overcome a sin again even if you haven't fallen into a sin of your past life uh, if you mention for these are sins of my past life especially the sins against truthfulness for instance if you have a problem with lying then in that case even if you're if you're just struggling with it or even if you're not it'll give you the grace later because of the sacramental graces to stay out of the sin Leo X says that you actually atone for the sins when you, that you've confessed in your past life, except for the scrupulous, that's another matter. But if you're not scrupulous and you confess the sins, like in this case, for these are sins of my past life, especially go, those against charity or something like that, Saint, uh, Leo X says it atones for the sin. There's a certain atonement for it, and so you're, um, you're going to have to pay less before, in the eyes of God for the sin that you've committed. The last thing is, is that there is no sin that is so bad that cannot be absolved save one, final impenitence. Now, this is important because some people think that they've done things that are so bad, and they're so worried about what the priest is going to think, that they think, well, I, I, I can't go to confession, or it's so bad God couldn't forgive me. That's just false. As long as you are contrite, that is, if you're truly sorry, because... Mercy is for the contrite, as it says in the Old Testament. Mercy is for the contrite, and it is also for the ignorant. But if you are sorry for your sins, there is nothing so bad that God can't forgive uh, via the priest. So make sure you get to confession, regardless of that, and recognize that even though the priest has to make an act of judgment about what, is, what penance is due to you out of justice, Nevertheless, he's there to render God's mercy to you because of your, uh, the fact that you're contrite. Also, uh, and as a, as a last observation, the confession should be a thing of devotion. You should really try and go to confession as a matter of devotion. The sacrament of confession is a holy and sacred thing, and you can have a devotion to God's mercy through that sacrament. And so working on a devotion that is of, of making sure that you do it reverently and doing it as best as possible and things like that, and thanking God afterwards for having forgiven your sins and things like that, increases your devotion and can actually aid you a great deal in your spiritual life. Therefore, get to confession frequently, do it properly, 